Um, I'm beginning the story in December 1941. The London Blitz was over, but on the 7th of December, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, bringing the US into World War II and giving the Allies a new hope of defeating Hitler. The BBC This is a picture of Sayers in her, in her, the statue in her hometown of Whittam in Essex. The BBC was then as now engulfed in controversy, and the most recent crisis had been the banning of the popular Glasgow Orpheus Choir from the airwaves because its musical director, Sir Hugh Roberton, was a pacifist. Vaughan Williams withdrew a symphony in protest, and Churchin, Churchill himself finally settled the matter, saying there was no reason to think Roberton's pacifist views would make him play flat. <laughs> the director of religious broadcasting, Dr James Welsh, about whom we'll be hearing quite a lot in this talk, believed in freedom of speech and argued strongly against the pacifist ban, which didn't end there, it just rumbled on throughout the whole war. Welsh loved a fight, and he had another controversial project up his sleeve. Eighteen months earlier, he'd invited Dorothy L. Sayers to write a 12-part radio Life of Christ, and the first episode, The Nativity, was scheduled for Sunday, 21st of December, 1941. On December the 10th, Welsh and Sayers held a press conference, and on December the 18th, the strongly Protestant Lord's Day Observance Society took out a full-page advert in the periodical, The Churchman. And this is it. A protest, radio impersonation of Christ, exclamation mark. Christian people were shocked during last weekend at the announcement of the proposed impersonation of our Lord Jesus Christ in a Sunday play on the wireless. It is intended to take place during the children's hour on a Sunday afternoon early in the new year. It's the first time a radio impersonation of Christ has been attempted anywhere in the world. The play is also to include the use of many modern slang terms in the presentation of New Testament history, which means, in effect, a spoliation of the beautiful language of the Holy Scriptures, which have been given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in the small print here we have uh, various phrases like act of irreverence bordering on the blasphemous. The plan was for Sayer's Life of Christ sequence, The Man Born to be King, to be broadcast monthly on Sunday evenings throughout 1942. I'm going to tell you the story of the events leading up to this expression of outrage, and I'm also going to look at some of the theological and dramatic issues that Sayers addressed. Sayers had previously written a BBC radio nativity broadcast in 1938, but of course a nativity doesn't involve an actor playing Jesus. This is uh, Sayers on the left, and that's James Welsh, director of religious broadcasting, uh, and uh, they're talking to each other during um, the, man, uh, the Man Born to be King um, sort of preparations and, and event. Note that Sayers has a cigarette in hand. She, <laughs> she always did, um, and here, because I couldn't resist it, is Sayers with her beloved cat Blitz, which we also saw in the um, statue uh, in, uh, that, that, that we saw in the, uh, in the beginning. And here she is, holding her beloved cat Blitz in the most loving way, and there is a cigarette in her. <laughs> I mean, extraordinary. Um, so anyway, so that, that, that Sayers, probably about, uh, about 1950, about 10 years after, after the man born to be king, um, when Welsh asked Sayers to dramatise a full life of Christ, Sayers' immediate response was that Jesus should be a character in the drama, something which was forbidden on the commercial stage. In the introduction to her earlier nativity, she had said she wanted to show that Jesus was, quote, was born not into the Bible, but into the world. Sayers believed that the, quote again, the device of indicating Christ's presence by a voice off or by a shaft of light or a shadow or whatnot tends to suggest to people that he was never a real person at all. 
Welsh was happy with this stipulation, and a major concern of Sayers in writing the plays was to show that Jesus was a real person who lived in history. He had a date in history. Having an actor to play Jesus is something we take for granted now, but between 1843 and 1968, all plays in the commercial theatre had to be submitted for approval to the Lord Chamberlain's office, which operated a system of censorship that now often seems hilarious or even tragic. It was forbidden to represent any of the persons of the Trinity on stage or to speak disparagingly of any heads of state, leading in the 1930s to some battles around the representation of Hitler. You couldn't say anything bad about Hitler on stage, essentially. The recommendation that Christ should be symbolised by a shaft of light or a voice off was actually made by the Lord Chamberlain in 1930. However, what was forbidden on the commercial stage was possible on the radio, provided there was no studio audience, because that would make it a live performance. The use of the word impersonation gives a clue to the thinking behind the objections. If you're familiar with the sitcom Dad's Army, you'll remember Private Fraser, the lugubrious Scot, who's always prophesying doom, played by the actor John Laurie. And if you look up John Laurie's Wikipedia entry, not that I'm recommending Wikipedia as a, as a reliable source of information necessarily, but if you do, it says he created the role of John the Baptist in Dorothy L. Sayers' cycle of plays, The Man Born to be King. It doesn't say he impersonated John the Baptist or that he was doomed forever as, as a result. This reflects a change in the way people think about the arts. The 20th century saw recognition that a work of art is not just a representation of something else, but has an independent existence. And this includes the ephemeral work of an actor bringing a stage role to life. Sayers herself ascribed this change in thinking to the Christian concept of a creator God, which is something we just haven't got time to pursue today. Um, of course, there are grey areas, for instance, when an actor plays the role of a historical figure, or even as in The Crown, um, someone who's actually living. Um, you can't say entirely divorce the creation of the role from its referent, from the person that it, it's representing. But nowadays, no one would refer to acting as impersonation. Dorothy L. Sayers recently made her name as a popular... Oh, this is a, this is a BBC recording studio. Um, it's awfully church-like, isn't it? And here, you see, we have this faint cross et etched into the window. So this, this was designated for religious uh, programmes. Dorothy L. Sayers originally made her name as a popular crime writer, but just as Conan Doyle grew bored of Sherlock and threw him over the waterfall, once Sayers had made enough money, she decided to marry off her sleuth, Lord Peter Whimsey, so that she could move on to drama, which was her real love. Here's Sayers at the Detection Club. It's actually my favourite picture of Sayers, um, because, look, she's so absorbed and interested and uh, so so sort of with the whole scene somehow I, I just really like that um she moved into drama with the canterbury festival in the 1930s um and later um in a series of festival plays for lichfield cathedral and for uh, the Festival of Britain uh, in Colchester. These are some props she made for the Festival of Britain in Colchester. Um, she liked to immerse herself in the whole of the dramatic production, you know, backstage, making props, making tea for the actors, just doing everything. She loved the whole process, the whole community of the theatre. Here's one of her early plays, very hieratic, and that's pre-war. Uh, th this was actually a revival after the war, and I don't think it went down so well. You couldn't really do all this stuff. The, things changed during the war, and this hieratic, very liturgical kind of presentation gave way to a degree of realism, which we'll see in The Man Born to be King. Uh, this, is, this is an audience for one of Sayers' earlier plays. Um, and you, it's pre, you can tell it's pre-war because all the women are wearing hats. Every woman is wearing a hat. Um, I think that that is Sayers because the hat she's wearing is, is one that she also wore when she was photographed with the cast of her early play, The Zeal of Thy House. 
Um, in the 1930s, Sayers was also making her name as a Christian apologist. And in January 1941, she was the only woman speaker at a conference of theologians discussing ideas for post-war reconstruction. That was at the height of the Blitz, extraordinary thing to do. The Man Born to be King was commissioned for BBC Children's Hour to be produced in the Bristol studio under the leadership of Derek McCulloch, who was known as Uncle Mac to many generations of, um, of, of listeners. Yes, he, he, <laughs> yeah, he, he was Larry the Lamb and all sorts of other things. So when the first draft of the first play, Kings in Judea, was submitted to the Bristol department, McCulloch's assistant, May Jenkin, wrote asking Sayers if the department could edit where the text was considered too obscure for the children's hour audience. Sayers didn't believe in talking down to children. She liked to give them the full polysyllabic works. Sayers objected to this and a number of angry exchanges ensued. When Derek McCulloch suggested she travel down to Bristol to discuss it with the team, Sayers' response was as follows. Dear Mr McCulloch, she'd, she'd never met him, she didn't know him, oh no you don't, my poppet. You won't get me to do three days of exhausting travel to Bristol in order to argue about my plays with a committee. What goes into the play and the language in which it is, in which it is written is the author's business. If the management don't like it, they reject the play and there's an end of the contract. Well, Sayers said she would withdraw from the project unless the producer Val Gielgud, brother of the famous actor, could take it on. She'd worked with him before. And this is Gielgud. Dig those specs. Um, and this is all... Whoops. This is also Gielgud. This is Gielgud as sketched by... Um, Sayers' husband, Mac Fleming, who was a pretty good artist, actually, although as their marriage went on, he got more and more depressed by the fact that Sayers was so famous and he wasn't famous. So um, they weren't that happy together by the end, but initially they were happy, and he was quite a good artist. So in his authorised biography, James Brabazon doesn't mince words about this episode. Let it be said now by someone who has been a professional in the theatrical business for almost 30 years, that in this matter, whatever the outcome, it was the staff of the BBC who be behaved like professionals. And Dorothy, he knew Sayers personally, who behaved like a spoilt and hysterical amateur. Well, she eventually se secured Gielgud and was assured of Sayers cooperation. It's this thing where, you know, Wagner was an anti-Semite, but he gave us the ring. Sayers threw all the toys out of the pram. She behaved disgracefully, but she gave us the masterpiece in the end. It's something you've always got to weigh up, isn't it, when you're um, sort of thinking about art, and is it totally divorced from the life and behaviour of the person who creates it? It's a perennial um, conundrum. The project was supported by the BBC's Central Religious Advisory Committee, which was full of bishops and theologians, and they were reassured by Sayers' compendious reading and the fact that she taught herself New Testament Greek in order to be able to translate the Bible from the original. Things now progressed smoothly until the press conference on 10th of December. To give a flavour of the dialogue, Sayers read a section from the opening of Play 4, which you've got on your handout in front of you. And it's a debate between the disciples on the right attitude towards money. I don't know if you want to have a look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to summarise it. The disciple Philip has been cheated on the market buying provisions for the group. And the Cockney disciple Matthew tells him he has been had for a sucker. The Daily Mail headline the following day was BBC Life of Christ play in US slang, with the Daily Herald going for gangsterisms in Bible play. <coughs> As it happens, this was the very day the US declared war on Germany, and the suggestion that American was an inappropriate language for Jesus' disciples was quickly dropped. <laughs> December the 18th, a few days later, saw the Lord's Day Observance Society's protest that we saw earlier. The, obje the objections were, large were largely from the evangelical wing of the church, but behind them, there were anxieties which were felt by all churchgoers. 
mainly that any religious broadcast was in danger of becoming a substitute for actually going to church. And that was a, a, an anxiety, a perennial anxiety that dogged all the discussions of the religious advisory committee and, and more widely as well. Um, what was the function of religious broadcasting? Was it a substitute for church or was it in some way to supplement it? James Welsh's vision was absolutely undoubtedly that he wanted to reach out beyond churchgoers. It was fine for churchgoers to, uh, to listen to the broadcasts, but he wanted to reach out beyond church, existing churchgoers to unchurched people or people who perhaps been to church as children and then, then given up. He, 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 there was a mission, an element of mission in James Welsh's vision. The Central Religious Advisory Committee rallied round and although a question was asked in Parliament, there was never a serious possibility that the plays would be halted. A recent online blog says, the extent and volume of the criticism came as a surprise to Welsh, who dispiritedly recalled, it was not an encouraging reception for a great evangelistic enterprise. I don't believe anyone was surprised, though Welsh was probably taken aback by Sayre's choice of extract. There's in fact very little slang in the play, hardly any. Uh, <laughs> um, and to my mind, Sayre's chose that passage as a publicity stunt. And although she adopted an attitude of injured innocence throughout, she'd worked eight years in advertising and she knew exactly how to manipulate popular opinion. In her introduction to the published plays, she gleefully mentions the Lord's Day Observance Society and the Protestant Truth Society, who so obligingly did all our publicity for us at, I fear, considerable expense to themselves. <laughs> and Welsh, in his foreword, rather impishly, noted that while some said that Singapore fell because these plays were broadcast, <laughs> they were answered by the supporter who thanked us for the plays, which ending in, in October, made possible the November victories in Libya and Russia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in their, in their introduction to the published plays, both Sayers and Wells choose to quote the more extreme responses, obviously, and there were lots of people who wrote in, uh, uh, huge numbers of people who wrote in saying what a wonderful thing the plays were, how it had deepened their spirituality, you know, calmed the fevered atmosphere at home, all that sort of thing. Um, but but, but it, it's just too good a story for them to, to let up on that. So Sayer's introduction to the plays is well worth reading for its theological insight and sheer brio. She was driven primarily by the need to communicate the Gospels without preaching. And she says, It was assumed by many pious persons who approved the project that my object in writing The Man Born to be King was, quote, to do good. But that was not, in fact, not my object at all though it was quite properly the object of those who commissioned the plays in the first place. My object was to make as good a work of art as I could. It is the business of the dramatist to approach the job of truth-telling from his own end and trust the, theolo trust the theology to emerge undistorted from the dramatic presentation of the story. There is no more searching test of a theology than to submit it to dramatic handling Nothing so glaringly exposes inconsistencies in a character, a story or a philosophy than to put it on stage and allow it to speak for itself. And that was Sayer's strongly held view. Sometimes involved her in a bit of special pleading. James Welsh, in a Radio Times article a few days before the first broadcast, prepared listeners for the exercise of artistic imagination. It is impossible to dramatise the life of Jesus without interpretation. None of the dangers of the dramatic method is absent from preaching or writing when the subject is the Son of God. So he's saying, you know, even your average sermon interprets Jesus' life. And that's what Sayers is doing. Sayers got on very well with the Archbishop of York, William Temple. And his book, Readings in St. John's Gospel, was a key influence on the man born to be king. Like Welsh, Temple emphasised that the gospel narrative is unavoidably filtered through the mind, not only of the gospeler, but also of the contemporary reader. He said, what reaches us is never a certified record, but always a personal impression. 
that, of course, that's not universally accepted in the Christian world, but Welsh and um, Temple in the mid-20th century were examples of mainstream church people um, who accepted a, a fairly liberal approach to the Bible. Sayers took a more literal view of the Bible than Temple and Welsh, but she not only thought it was okay to invent dialogue, but cre she created an overarching structure linking the plays with the conflict between Jesus and Judas at the centre. She wrote to Welsh, this is quite early on, it looks as though I should have to pull myself together and really make up my mind about Judas. What did the man imagine he was doing? Pilate and Caiaphas and the rest are quite understandable, but Judas is an insoluble riddle. One can't suppose that Christ deliberately chose a traitor in order to get himself betrayed. That isn't the kind of thing one would expect any decent man, let alone any decent God, to do. And he can't have been so stupid as to have been taken in by an obviously bad hat. Judas must have been a case of corruptio optimi pessima, which is Latin for the corruption of the best is the worst. But what corrupted him? If we can get a coherent Judas, we can probably get a coherent plot. This is a design for the costume of Judas in one of Sayer's later plays. Um, in fact, uh, the Litchfield the Festival play of 1946. Um, and that's a picture of... The, that's Nora Lamborn who designed that costume I just showed you. That says on the left, obviously. Um, this, is, this, this, is, um, <coughs> this is actually from the Emperor Constantine, her Festival of Britain play in 1951. That's Graham Suter who um, co-directed co the Festival of Britain play. And, and I'll, I'll just put this in because Graham Suter was somebody I actually knew. Um, so it gives me pleasure to see somebody actually knew standing next to Sayers and collaborating with her. It just gives me such pleasure, um, that, that, that link back to Sayers herself. Um, anyway, in Sayers' time, Judas was commonly assumed to be a disappointed revolutionary, and she gives the story a twist by reversing that. Judas betrays Jesus because he believes Jesus is preaching peace, on the one hand, and at the same time hypocritically planning a military coup. This invented plot line, and obviously it is an invented plot line, we don't know why Judas betrayed Jesus, um, it drives forward, drives the story forward from Jesus' ministry to the given ending of the trials, crucifixion and resurrection. And it involves a fictional major character, Baruch, the revolutionary leader. Judas's motivation has been debated from patristic times to the present. For instance, St. Augustine suggested Judas's calling as a disciple must have been on a different basis from the others. Origen argued that he changed during the ministry. And while Dante damned him irretrievably, the 20th century theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar saw all hell as being within Christ's salvific, salvific scope. And Sayers herself wrote a poem in which Jesus accompanies Judas to the gate of hell. It's this, it's terribly Edwardian, painfully, embarrassingly Edwardian, but the message is there. Brotherly wise and hand in hand to paradise they came, meaning the world beyond. Satan looked out from Hades' gate, his hand upon the key. Good souls, before I let you in, first tell me who ye be. We be two men that died of late and come to keep hell's tryst. This is Judas Iscariot, and I am Jesus Christ, you have to pronounce it. So that's a sort of early effort when Sarah was about 20, but it shows an early interest in the fate of Judas and the associated Christology. What theologians of widely separated periods agree on is the importance of Judas for Christology. The key question is why Jesus chose Judas as a disciple. As Sayers said, to choose an obvious crook for the purpose of letting him damn himself would be the act of a devil. And for most of the story, Jesus believes Judas might not betray him, which obviously is theologically um, huge. 
So Judas's first appearance is in play four, which you've got there on the handout, the one that she read out at the, um, at the press conference. Philip has been cheated in the market and the disciples are divided on whether to accept the loss as a practical exercise in humility or whether to challenge the con man in the interests of justice. And the debate ends with Matthew's, ref and, and says works in the parable of the unjust steward, um, which is an interesting example of her technique. Most of Jesus's parables haven't got any sort of context in the Bible. Sayers creates contexts for them in which they appear to flow naturally. She does that again and again with the parables and it, it's cleverly done. Anyway, Math Matthew refuses the office of, office of treasurer on the grounds that he doesn't want to put himself in the way of temptation. And at this point, the door opens to reveal Judas seeking to become Jesus's disciple. So Judas is introduced immediately following Matthew's rejection of an opportunity for sin. And the context implies that sin, even Judas's, is not predestined, but can be addressed by a person with the necessary humility. And Jesus himself says to Judas later on in the scene, can you be faithful? He has a sense that things could go wrong here, but he doesn't, he's human, Sayers stresses his humanity. I mean, she believes fully in his dual nature, God and man, but she says she stresses his humanity in order to emphasize that this is a historical figure. These are things that really happened. The scene makes it clear that while Jesus did not choose Judas in order that he could be betrayed, nevertheless, from the outset, Jesus was aware at some level of the possibility of betrayal. And Sayers wrote, there is no need to suppose that Jesus with his human mind foresees certainly or in detail what Judas will do to him. What he does know certainly is that his father's will must be fulfilled, if not this way, then that way. Oh, the, uh, the, other, photo, the other picture I, I showed you before this, that was Giotto's... Um, Giotto's uh, Oh, I can't go backwards, never mind. The, the first picture I showed you was Giotto's um, representation of the Judas kiss, which has very much exercised our artists down the centuries. And in the Giotto picture, um, Jesus and Judas are just looking, at, Judas is embracing Jesus and they're just looking at each other, in the face, staring at each other. Um, a lot of iconography of Judas has emphasised a close personal relationship with Jesus, um, disappointed love even, um, just something that has turned Judas and, you know, a very great intensity. Um, this is different. This is Caravaggio in the early um, 17th century. And there's Judas. You see his intensity and his terribly anxious, furrowed brow as he looked at Jesus. But Jesus is looking down, he's twisting his hands here in a different source of light from the one that's illuminating their faces. And he's facing his own death. He's going into himself to face his own death. And that for me gives this painting a terrific universality. Jesus is experiencing something we all face. And Judas is irrelevant in this moment, although we see the terrible pain and passion that drives him to it. I just think this is, this is one of the great religious paintings as far as I'm concerned. It's just extraordinary. Right, to return to the talk. <laughs> um, so th this is a very big theological implication that um, uh, says, says, Jesus knows his father's will must be fulfilled. If not this way, then that way. Not a straight line of predestination. It's got to be this way. Um, God's will will be done, but human beings have free will and it can come about different ways. Sayers could not believe in a Jesus who would choose Judas specifically as an instrument of the passion. In the play, even as he goes to hang himself, Judas admits that Jesus would forgive him, emphatically making the point that he chooses his own damnation. Central to Sayers' theology was a belief in free will, and she did not believe that Jesus' story was inescapably predestined to unfold the way it did. In one of the resurrection appearances in the final play, which is after, uh, which is after the resurrection, Jesus says, you are not slaves but sons, free to be false or faithful, 
free to reject or confess me, free to crucify God or be crucified with him, sharing the shame and sorrow and the bitter cross and the glory. It's a significant theological challenge because we talk about God's divine plan for humanity, about his will for us as individuals. There have been several plays and films suggesting that Judas was an innocent victim of God's damnation. For instance, Stephen and Ligurgis' The Last Days of Judas Iscariot. That's about 15 years ago. Um, but it made quite a splash. I don't think it was very good, but it made quite a splash. I think because this is something that actually interests people. Was Judas predestined to do what he did? Is, is our condemnation of him quite fair? And so says, yes, he had free will. Oh, sorry, turned the page quite too quickly. Play 11 is Sayer's Passion Play, and it was my own introduction to Sayer's work at the age of um, 17 when I took play, uh, part in a Holy Week reading. And we also took it to Wakefield High Security Jail, not quite sure what, <laughs> what they made of it there. In the introduction to the play, Sayers sarcastically addresses the gap between the brutality of the story and the dignity popularly expected of a sacred subject. They mocked and railed on him and smote him. They scourged and crucified him. Well, they were people very remote from ourselves, and no doubt it was all done in the noblest and most beautiful manner. We should not like to think otherwise. As a detective story writer, Sayers was used to presenting ugly scenes, and she was adept at leaving the reader's imagination to fill out the picture. She brings the same technique to the passion play, and in my view, prompts the listener to imagine a scenario far more shocking than anything that could be simulated on stage or film. The medium of radio invites the listener to collaborate with the writer and actors in bringing the scene to life. In the Passion sequence, Sayers limits Jesus' speeches to the relatively few words recorded in the Gospels. And as it's a radio play, the challenge for the dramatist is to maintain Jesus' centrality in spite of his long silences. She does this through the reactions of the crowd so that the audience experiences it through the eyes of the characters who are viewing the way of the cross as a spectacle. All the liturgical stations of the cross except for the third fall appear in some form. The play opens with a dialogue between two boys whose childish voices underline the horror of the event. By contrast, Mary the Virgin, John and Mary Magdalene speak in a stylized way as a reminder of the scene's eternal dimension. As the two robbers to be crucified with Jesus, Dismas and Jesters, pass by, the spectators do not hold back their words or their missiles, and this gives an impression of the vulgar brutality directed at crucifixion victims without offending those listeners who might think the full humiliation of Jesus himself should not re be represented. So Jester says, they've knocked my blasted teeth out! And the first soldier says, you won't need teeth where you're going! Laughter. Move on, will you? Then when Jesus stumbles, a woman shouts, I hate you, Cling. Get on with you. Be a man. And Baruch, the fictional character, the revolutionary, shouts out, you don't, need a, you don't know a man when you see one. To bear the unbearable, to go on when the thing is impossible, that's courage. Hosanna, son of man. Hosanna. So that's the sort of suggestion of the way of the cross that Sayers makes. The woman's shout to be a man is in its, its way as horrible as the torture it makes light of. The crucifixion itself is inferred from the dialogue of the soldiers and suggested by the sound of a hammer. Kick his feet from under him. No need, it's down. Take the feet, Corvus. Stretch your legs. I'll give you king of the Jews. Hand me the mallet. Horrible. Jesus then says, Father, forgive them, breaking off as the mallet falls and the scene fades out. So you don't need the explicit brutality of Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. I don't know if you've seen that. Two hours of just solid beating and bashing. Um, you know, no, no sort of visual effect spared. You don't need that. And Sayers shows us that. So the noisy way of the cross is interspersed with the calm of scenes back at the office as the Roman and Jewish authorities assess the situation. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus quiz Caiaphas, not very courageously, about what's been done. Was it necessary, most venerable, to lick the feet of Rome in public? Caiaphas replies in prophetic mode, I've killed this Jesus, but for one, but for one pretender crucified, 50 will arise. One day the zealots will revolt, 
the dead will lie thick in the streets, and the tramp of the legions will be heard in the inner sanctuary of the temple. I, Caiaphas, prophesy. Be content, Jesus, my enemy. Caiaphas also will have lived in vain. Play 11 concludes with several of Sayers' tie rods, themes holding the structure together. And at the deposition from the cross, Mary the Virgin says, give me my son into my arms, just as she did at the nativity. And later she gives King Balthazar's nativity gift of myrrh to the women who go to anoint Jesus' body. This hieratic, almost liturgical quality is balanced by Sayers' determination to present events as they might have appeared to people experiencing them without knowing the outcome. There's one scene where she zooms out into a long historical perspective <coughs> when Pilate's wife, Claudia, describes a prophetic dream in which she hears millions of voices down the centuries speaking the name of her husband in different languages. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucifié sous Pons Pilate, gekreuzigt unter Pontius Pilatus. In the final scene of the Passion Play, Pilate refuses to help Caiaphas to control the rumours of resurrection, which are already arising. The man born to be king was overall judged a great success, with two million adult listeners, and it was frequently repeated on the radio in the years following. Um, oh, this, is, uh, this is from another of Sayers' plays, actually, the Litchfield play. It's the Beatitudes, and the man who takes the uh, part of Christ, Rafe de la Tour, he, in some of the later recording, re-recordings of Man Born to be King, he took the part of, of Jesus. Um, Archbishop William Temple offered Sayers a Lambeth doctorate in recognition of the importance of the sequence, and she, re she refused it, saying she was never certain that she was a convincing enough Christian and that her faith was a matter of the head rather than the heart. She hated to be asked by journalists to talk about what my faith means to me, saying her faith was of no interest to anyone else and people should study the Bible and the creeds to discover what their faith means to them. It's also possible that she felt she couldn't accept a religious accolade because she was the mother of an illegitimate son whom she kept completely secret and if it had come out she would have been accused of hypocrisy. There she is, at, uh, at a, I don't know which play that's a rehearsal of. I think that's a pen rather than a cigar, actually. A fork and some brownie, perhaps. And that's a, that's, that's a sketch of says by her husband, Mac Fleming. I, I think that's a very affectionate sketch, although some commentators make a lot of the fact that they fell out quite often in the later years. I think there was always real affection between them, you know. Anyway, on Good Friday, 1954, Three years before her premature death, Sayers was challenged by a young scientist at her church who accused her of promoting an arid religion without feeling. And she wrote a 5,000 word letter in response in which she coined the phrase, the passionate intellect. Head and heart don't necessarily have to be at odds. And Hans Urs von Balthasar wrote in the mid-century, faith means preferring the divine truth before one's own truth because God is what he is. Faith is the intellect's love for God. So Sayers was not the only person who talked about passionate intellect, sort of uh, the intellectual heart and all that. Easter 1954 was the time of Billy Graham's first crusade in Haringey Stadium. I think I'm the only commentator who has actually mentioned that in print. It seems to me to be hugely important for Sayers thinking in this, le in this enormous apologia that she wrote at this time. Um, although Sayers doesn't mention Billy Graham in the letters, she must have been aware that a new religious spirit with a confessional basis was sweeping the country. Everything was changing. In fact, however, Sayers always asked people to judge her on her work, not on anything she might say. And if we go back to the man born to be king, we note that Judas goes wrong because he tries to project an ideology onto Jesus, whereas the other disciples simply love him and trust what he says. So in the plays, heart wins over head, whatever Sayers might have said when she was talking to journalists, and that's what she shows. 
Sayer saw her job as being to give people the Bible and the creeds in language they could understand and to leave them to continue on an intellectual and spiritual journey beyond the ending of the plays if they chose to do so. She concluded the sequence with the ending of St John's Gospel. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Sayers ends the sequence by saying Jesus is infinite and sending her listeners back to the source. Thank you. Oh, and this, ha ha. Miss Dorothy, E.C. Bentley invented the clary hue, the sort of four line little poem encapsulating, describing someone. Miss Dorothy Sayers never cared about the Himalayas. The height that gave her a thrill was Primrose Hill. I think that's, no, it's not actually a reference. Well, Primrose Hill is a hill near Highgate, but I think it actually means St. Mary's Primrose Hill, which was noted for being rather high church. So Sayers didn't go there herself, but quite a number of her friends did. And I think that's, that's what the reference is. There, so thank you very much.